Hello everyone. My name is Ebony Bennett. I'm the Deputy Director here at the Australia Institute and welcome to the Australia Institute's Economics of a Pandemic webinar series. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm currently living, which is the UN Nation, as well as the Ngunnawal people, home to the office of uh, the Australia Institute in Canberra. And I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and pay my respects to elders past and present and to any Aboriginal or, or Torres Strait Islander uh, people we have on the line with us today. The Australia Institute is one of the country's leading influential think tanks. We're based in Canberra normally, even though we're all working from home at the, at the moment. And I want to thank all of our supporters for joining us online and for so many of these webinars that we've been holding. Um, we are aiming to do these webinars at least weekly, but the days and times do vary. So please make sure that you're subscribed at tai.org.au to make sure that you don't miss out. And just a few tips before we begin today's webinar to help make sure that this runs smoothly. So uh, please forgive us any technical difficulties, although we're not doing too bad so far. Um, if you hover over the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see a couple of different functions. There's a Q&A function where you can type out a question to our panelists. You can also upvote or make comments on other people's questions. If you'd like to ask your question of the panel directly, there's a raise your hand function that'll let us know that you'd like to be called upon and we'll try and come to you live um, to ask your question in person in the second half of the webinar. Please make sure you keep things uh, civil in the chat. And lastly, this discussion is being recorded and it will be posted up on our website and emailed to everyone who registered after this discussion. And normally we also upload the audio as a podcast on our Follow the Money podcast. So for a long time, uh, we've been told basically that Australian manufacturing is uncompetitive, that it's dirty, old and unnecessary, uh, and that we can sidestep making what we materially use simply by selling the raw materials to the rest of the world and re-importing them as goods uh, with a markup. But the pandemic has shown us that dependency on foreign manufacturers and long supply chains that cross multiple borders really does present other risks as well. And so to that extent, uh, to, sorry, to the extent that we did have manufacturing and still do in Australia, we've been told repeatedly that we can't do it competitively without fossil fuels powering our electricity grid. But today we're gonna to talk to you about why that's not the case. And to say there's been renewed interest in Australian manufacturing recently would be an understatement. So the question today is, how can a resurgent manufacturing sector be part of the transition to a low carbon economy? And I'm delighted to introduce three very distinguished guests today. Professor Ross Garno, the Professorial Research Fellow in Economics at the University of Melbourne and the author of the recent book, uh, and a bestseller, I believe, Superpower, Australia's Low Carbon Opportunity. Dr. Jim Stanford is the Director of the Centre for Future Work at the Australia Institute and one of the world's leading economists to boot. And Dan Nahum is the economist at the uh, Australian Institute Centre for Future Work and also author of a paper that you might have read about in the New Daily today. G'day, Ross, Jim and Dan. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Jim, I might hand over to you uh, to introduce the professor. Thank you very much, uh, Ebony. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jim Stanford, the director of the Center for Future Work, and I've got one job and a very pleasurable job today in the webinar, and that's to introduce uh, our guest speaker, Professor Ross Garneau. Um, uh, Ross is, uh, in my view, one of Australia's most eminent and respected and multi-talented uh, of Australia's uh, economists. Uh, the number of different topics and professions that he's pursued in his career is uh, uh, astounding. Uh, he is a professor of economics at the University of Melbourne, formerly distinguished professor of economics at uh, ANU, uh, where he directed the uh, Asia Pacific School of Economics and Management and was also longstanding head of the uh, economics department. He's fulfilled many other roles as a policy advisor, diplomat, uh, businessman, uh, Australia's ambassador to China, uh, I first heard Professor Garneau speak um, at the second National Manufacturing Summit that our centre co-sponsored. Uh, this would be now in 2018 at uh, Australian Parliament House. And uh, Professor Garneau was a, a speaker. Uh, he gave uh, actually a, an incredibly compelling presentation about how renewable energy 
uh, was changing fundamentally the economics of, of energy, but also of industry uh, in Australia. And I remember he concluded his presentation with a, a call that uh, gave me tingles down my back, frankly, uh, expressing his hope that Australia would become a sustainable manufacturing superpower. Uh, those three words uh, still ringing in my ears. Uh, he then went on to actually write a book on that very subject. Uh, I'm actually just going to put up the, the title of the book uh, uh, right here for uh, the benefit of folks, uh, Superpower, uh, the uh, Australia's Low Carbon Opportunity. It is a bestseller, and let's make it an even more of a bestseller for the thousand plus people on this webinar. You can order this from uh, Black Ink Books. Uh, there's the website uh, at the bottom, and it's, uh, it's a wonderful book, uh, deserving of all the attention uh, that it's getting. So um, that work, uh, I think, is helping to shift the debate and cement the case for renewable energy, not just as a, as a, a source of uh, sustainable energy for everything that we use it for, but as a, uh, a primary driver of uh, a resurgence of Australian manufacturing. So uh, with my, pl my pleasure to introduce Professor Garneau. Thank you so much for being with us today, sir. Very good to be uh, with you, uh, Jim and uh, Ebony, uh, and the and everyone who's uh, part of the the webinar. Uh, uh, I'm participating from the very middle of Queensland, from uh, Buck Alden, uh, which happens to be uh, uh, the the place, the Shire, the, that underneath the ground has some of the world's best uh, uh, unutilized uh, coal resources, and above its head, it's got uh, Eastern Australia's uh, uh, best solar resources, just about the, uh, the the best in the world. All around us, uh, huge potential for biomass, uh, which I say in superpower, potentially a very important uh, input into industrial uh, production in the zero emissions uh, world economy. So it's sort, sort of a, 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 a fulcrum of, of the old and the new, uh, the, the beginnings of uh, much of the Australian labour movement uh, here in Barcald and one and a quarter centuries ago. Uh, and it's not a bad place to think about the transition we've got to make and the opportunity for, for making a very productive transmit, uh, transition. Uh, I see us as really being given a, a new chance um, at building a sustainable manufacturing future. Uh, we, we've muffed things a bit uh, from time to time in the past. Uh, I've been writing on these things, working on these things for, for a very long time. And uh, uh, we, we sometimes forget that uh, uh, 130 years ago, when uh, Australia was the richest country in the world in per capita income, Australian wages by far the highest in the world, uh, we had a flourishing uh, and diversified uh, export of manufacturers, uh, a lot of um, agricultural machinery going to Latin America and, and the United States. So uh, we're, we're an exporter of steel. Uh, we turned inwards and turned away from that opportunity. And, and we started to, to, uh, uh, to move again in, in a new direction um, for a couple of decades, uh, uh, the period of reform uh, uh, when uh, uh, Hawke was Prime Minister, late, later Keating, the, the first few years of, uh, of Howard, from 83 to 2003, uh, when we uh, really focused on making ourselves a globally competitive economy, a lot of cooperation between um, Australian governments, state and federal, uh, uh, the, the labour, labour movement and uh, Australian business, strong focus on global competitiveness. And for a couple of decades, we had compound... Uh, uh, growth of um, uh, volume of manufactured exports in excess of 10%. And it's starting to become uh, an important element of our economy, uh, as big uh, as, as resources at the beginning of, the, of this, this century, uh, uh, and as big as agriculture. Uh, uh, but uh, um, we, we uh, lost uh, uh, that momentum. Uh, through uh, the resources boom, the China resources boom from 2003 to 2013. I, I tell that story uh, in my book, Dog Days, which came out in 2013, which anticipated a, a period of, uh, uh, of stagnation of incomes um, uh, going forward because uh, we, we hadn't managed that boom very well. Um, uh, of course, uh, we, we got lots of benefit from that, but uh, we could have had a lot more if we'd uh, kept an eye on the requirements of global competitiveness. We let the real exchange rate 
rise too high, basically, by spending the resources income as it came in. That played a major role in uh, crippling the growth in uh, manufacturing and service exports, which had had for two decades very strong um, uh, momentum. Uh, uh, I remember a conversation I had in, in 2013 with the chief executive of uh, Toyota. Uh, at the time, the uh, Australian dollar was worth a, a dollar five US. Uh, and uh, uh, he was saying that the, the, the government in Canberra, um, Hockey was treasurer and now but prime minister, is uh, forcing us to take a decision now on uh, whether we'll stay in business and uh, in Australia. And uh, uh, if we had an exchange rate of 80 cents, then this would be one of our uh, uh, good plants globally. But at a dollar five, uh, when they're forcing us to make this decision, there's only one decision, that's to get out. And and uh, once they got out, uh, they, they weren't going to uh, easily come, come back. Uh, so uh, I, I think we mismanaged macro policy at that time, lost sight of uh, uh, the, uh, the importance of uh, long-term global competitiveness. That's a big story in itself. I won't go into that now. But the good news is that we're get, going to be given another chance. Uh, and uh, uh, to, to utilise this chance, uh, we've got to keep a strong eye on our global advantages. So we've, we've got advantages of a highly skilled uh, uh, well-trained, well-educated population, uh, so, uh, and all of the, the, the really high-class, highly productive manufacturing countries have got that. Uh, Germany, uh, uh, the world's biggest exporter of sophisticated machine goods and so on. It's a high-wage company. The country, high social security uh, country, uh, but uh, competitive because uh, of its skills and uh, uh, and uh, uh, it, the education of its labour force. So uh, the, the things that work will be capital intensive. Uh, the things that work will have their eye on global markets, uh, not just domestic markets, because we're a small market. And in today's world, you, you don't uh, build a competitive manufacturing industry on a market for 25 million people. We've got to find niches in the world and we can do so. It's got to build uh, as much as possible on Australia's uh, special natural advantages and processing our, our minerals is one of these. We are by far the world's biggest uh, supplier of uh, iron, oxi iron oxide for turning into uh, iron metal, aluminium oxide for turning into aluminium metal, but we uh, turn very little of that raw material into uh, final products. Um, uh, but there are many other uh, industries of that kind and uh, the, the report that we're discussing today uh, identifies a lot of those, a lot of those associated with the uh, the new economy, uh, uh, mineral materials that are going to be important in uh, uh, in the growth of renewable energy and new industries uh, with zero emissions. They're, they're all opportunities for Australia. Uh, I mentioned, apart from aluminium and steel, I mentioned uh, silicon and a number of others uh, uh, in the book. But the, but the, the big advantage uh, it's going to become more and more important in the next several decades is that uh, of all the developed countries, uh, we have by far the richest combination of uh, solar and wind resources. Uh, and we, as the world goes towards zero emissions, that's what we have to do to avoid uh, uh, climate instability, which will be very dangerous to our standard of living, uh, to, to uh, a good order in the international community. We, the international community, except for the President of the United States, has decided that we've got to do something about this. And uh, uh, in Paris, uh, we, we all have committed ourselves implicitly to uh, zero emissions in our economic activity by the middle of the century. We need zero emissions because until you have zero emissions, then pressures for higher temperature just keep increasing. Lower emissions won't stop increases in temperature. We have to have zero emissions. The so Paris goal is by uh, uh, middle of the century or earlier. Uh, and uh, uh, we are better equipped to, uh, to produce low cost energy in that emerging zero emissions economy. And that gives us uh, the potential to be the low energy cost country of the world. Uh, combine that with our other advantages and that gives us a, a new opportunity, another chance uh, in globally competitive manufacturing. I'll, I'll leave it there for the moment, Jim.
Thank you very much, Professor. Um, we might go now to you, Dan. Dan Nahum is the, uh, a senior economist at the Centre for Future Work, and he's released a, a paper today uh, around manufacturing and um, the opportunities around renewables. Uh, Dan, over to you. Thanks, Ebony. Um, yes, that's uh, correct. I've just released a paper called Powering Onwards, Australia's opportunity to reinvigorate manufacturing through renewable energy. And I'll um, uh, share some slides with you all. Um, and thank you also very much, um, Professor Garno, for being a part of this event today. Um, it's a huge honor, it's humbling that you're, uh, you're part of it. Um, so, um, excuse me. Uh, there we go. Okay, so that's just our contact details. Um, so uh, COVID-19 has been a really uh, important wake up call, I think, uh, for Australia uh, in terms of why we need a resilient uh, manufacturing uh, industry. Um, and, and coming out of this crisis, there won't be a, a back to normal things won't go back to the same way they were. Uh, and the government indeed have stopped talking about a, a snapback. They're not using that language anymore. Uh, the economy that recovers from COVID-19 won't look the same as the one that went into the pandemic. And so we need to view the period after the pandemic much more, um, much like a post-war rebuilding exercise. Um, a little bit like the Marshall Plan, this terminology that uh, um, Dr. Jim, my boss has used elsewhere. Um, so the government certainly knows that something is required. Uh, they're not sure what, but they're talking about things like a gas-led recovery. Um, so they're, they're openly discussing using economic planning uh, for, well, in this case, the benefit of people who uh, own fossil fuel companies. Um, uh, but, but they don't have the details sorted out. They're, they're not quite sure what to do. Um, so it turns out to be a, a timely, uh, timely, timely piece, my paper, and obviously that wasn't uh, the plan when I, I first began my work on it. Um, the question for us in the broader polity is looking at the real resources that Australia has available to it, uh, which include that superabundance of renewable resources uh, that Ross referred to. Um, so that's sun, wind, land mass, and even geothermal resources and a lot of underutilized labor because we're really in the process of trying to avoid depression mark too. Uh, how do we want to provision our society going forward? Because that's really what economies are for. They're about societal provisioning. And manufacturing is part of that story as it adds a lot of value to our endowment of resources, uh, not just our endowment of, of raw materials, minerals or, or what have you, um, but also, so labour, it's a source of good jobs and therefore it's a, a, a source of societal strength as well. So let's just have a quick think about why the government's scepticism might be justified. Why might renewables not work? You've, you've heard these arguments before. Um, renewables are expensive or they're not available in sufficient quantities, they're less reliable. Uh, or they're not suitable for certain industrial purposes, but none of those, none of those hold water, as it turns out. Renewables are appropriate for most manufacturing uses, um, with the remaining holes being plugged uh, as we speak. Uh, for example, what, one of those holes that comes to mind is using hydrogen in steel making rather than metallurgical coal. Um, there are quite a number of vignettes in my report identifying different applications for uh, renewables in manufacturing, and also showing how we can and should manufacture more um, domestically to catch up more value from our renewable endowment. So, uh, for example, uh, a domestic lithium ion battery industry. Um, now, this is where the, the rubber hits the road in terms of the, the economic analysis. So this is a graph comparing uh, what's called the levelized cost of electricity across different sources. And what levelized cost uh, means is it takes into account both the capital costs, so the, the setup costs, and also the marginal or running costs uh, of different um, sources of, of grid power. 
And you'll note that the cost of renewable energy is already less than the cost of newly installed gas. Um, and gas has erroneously been described as a transition fuel, but this graph makes clear that building new gas is not an economically sensible thing to do, uh, even when you take storage into account. Uh, also, none of the, uh, the fossil fuel figures here indicate the carbon price. There's a small risk premium associated with uh, those fossils to represent the possibility of a carbon price in future, and also to represent the availability of fuel, which of course we don't need uh, for the uh, renewable sources. Um, so I did uh, a, a fairly simple model, um, looking at what would happen if we uh, replaced all our uh, current fossil fuel uh, generation with new fossil fuel generation versus what would happen if we replaced it with um, renewables rather than um, more fossils. And that's not such a crazy assumption because a lot of our existing fossil generators are actually reaching the end of their working lives in the short to medium term anyway. You can uh, see from the reports that uh, the Australian energy market operator puts out when those, uh, when those uh, plants will be closing. So to be clear, this is, this is about new power generation or, or the, the replacement of old power. It's not about decommissioning uh, existing plants ahead of time, although I think that's a good idea as well. So there are a lot of different ways to, to calculate this and a range of economic literature on the topic. So my estimate is indicative, but it shows a 23% saving or a $1.6 billion uh, um, dollar per annum saving across the manufacturing sector should we move to renewables. I'd also like to point out that I'm conservative in my assumptions. Uh, and then there, there are manufacturers, big manufacturers like our Blue Scope Steel and Carlton United Breweries, who already have um, purchase power agreements with renewable energy, energy generators uh, resulting in much larger savings than, uh, than the, the number I arrived at. Um, and also I, I think this thing about sort of what undertaking new capital spending, what, what should we do when we undertake new capital spending is a really timely question because the government is spending a lot of money on the future shape of the economy as we speak. Uh, so it's, it's a great opportunity right now uh, to do this capital investment. And this is just a quick one showing uh, that there's an unavoidable arithmetic overlap uh, in positive responses out there in the community about how people feel about um, the importance of manufacturing and um, uh, the extent to which they favor renewables. And these results were all from before COVID-19 and also from before the bushfires. So we can probably reasonably expect that they've been buttressed uh, by those events. Um, <laughs> this is probably my favorite graph. I know it looks very detailed. Um, it, it manages to be simultaneously glum and alarming. And I'll talk you through it a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm not cherry picking data, which is why it's so detailed. This is all of the OECD countries. And this is what I call the bad place graph. Uh, you'll see um, that we're down here um, in the bottom right hand corner uh, with uh, Luxembourg. Uh, so we're kind of in the worst of all worlds. So uh, what this graph is saying is that we're a big emitter, that's the the X or, or uh, horizontal axis, and the, the Y axis, the vertical axis, is saying that we're not doing much manufacturing. So we emit a huge amount and we really don't get much manufacturing uh, relative uh, to those emissions. Um, so we're highly carbon intensive and ideally you'd like to be the opposite of where we are. You'd like to be in the top left hand corner, um, which is why I call it the bad place graph. Um, Incidentally, the picture looks even worse. We're even more of an outliner. If you, if you look at um, proportions uh, of uh, exports, manufacturers as a proportion of exports, uh, and that, those details are in the report. So we're kind of like a petro state. Um, ironically, we're one with all of these amazing renewable resources uh, on hand. So this is very much a policy choice uh, that, that we occupy this space. Now, you might say at this point, what about uh, the US or Canada? They're, they're like us, right? Well, they emit a little bit less per capita than us, not, not much less, but they actually do twice as much manufacturing as a proportion of GDP. People talk about 
that are hollowing out of the manufacturing sector in those countries, but they're still doing a whole lot better than Australia. So I'll, I'll wind up here with the recommendations from our report. Obviously, there's a lot more detail in these on the report itself, but um, clarity and stability in energy policy, uh, a price on carbon, um, government partnering with renewable energy and manufacturing firms to develop sustainable manufacturing potential, uh, sector-specific renewable industry strategies. And uh, on, on this one, you might think of green steel or aluminium or adding value to our lithium endowment. And there are more examples in the report, of course. Um, upgrading transmission to cope with decentralized power generation. Uh, number six is really important because if we're talking about redesigning the way we provision our society, it, it makes no sense to fall back into patterns of exploitative social relations. So fair employment practice and consultation involvement in traditional owners is, is an important one there, and environmental standards. Um, an independent statutory authority to de design the transition, essentially, for uh, workers that are affected um, by the movement from fossils into this renewable economy that we're envisioning. Um, activist institutional investment, so that's actually a recommendation for investors rather than uh, for government, uh, and hydrogen based on renewables, not hydrocarbons. Uh, that's, that's a path that we need to set now uh, for our hydrogen industry going forward. And obviously there's more detail on all of those uh, in the report. So thanks very much, and that's my presentation. Thank you very much, Dan. And uh, we will send um, that presentation around to uh, everyone who's registered along with the video recording at the end here, but we might start going to uh, questions now. Sorry, I will just say um, that report should be available at futurework.org.au if you want to uh, find that online. Um, <clears throat> I might go to questions now, though. Uh, the first one uh, is directed to you, Professor Garneau. It asks, uh, Marcus May asks, does the creation of new industries such as you promote require government leadership or can it progress despite government disinterest or indeed active avoidance? Uh, it can't progress with active avoidance. It would progress best with uh, uh, government having a clear view of what was in the future national interest and facilitating that in various ways. Uh, it can go quite a long way uh, with, uh, with government just doing well the things that any government has to do. Uh, just take the example of aluminium smelting. Um, uh, uh, and this is the, the subject of uh, uh, quite a lot of discussion in the repowering paper. But uh, uh, the, the chief executives of uh, uh, Alcoa uh, which owns the Portland smelter in Victoria and um, Rio Tinto, which own the smelters in Newcastle in New South Wales and Gladstone in Queensland, both made it clear that those very important manufacturing operations don't have a future if they continue to have high energy costs, which they do at present based on coal, and if they continue to be highly emissions intensive. And the Victorian smelter in particular is one of the most emissions intensive aluminium smelters in the world uh, because of the use of, of lignite for uh, electricity. Um, uh, what one could, could see the, the private sector uh, going a long way to uh, bringing together a renewable energy solution. Uh, but uh, there's some things that um, uh, do require uh, government to do the job of government well. well uh, trend, Transmission is a, uh, a natural monopoly, a public good, uh, and uh, government does have to have a role in, in planning and, and facilitating, and, and if, it if transmission is in private hands in eff effectively and efficient efficiently uh, regulating prices, that's what you have to do with a natural uh, monopoly. Now, we haven't done those things very well, so we have to start to do well things that, that governments have to do. Uh, and uh, uh, we can get quite a long way through governments just doing those things. We could get a lot further and faster 
uh, if, uh, in addition, uh, government uh, recognised the potential benefits for Australia of developments in this area uh, by doing other things. I mentioned in superpower that the recommendation of the ACCC that um, uh, that, that uh, the Commonwealth Government could uh, underwrite uh, long-term sales contracts uh, of electricity uh, to uh, reduce uncertainty uh, about long-term markets, and that would substantially reduce the cost of, of electricity. You would not need to make this uh, uh, available only to uh, renewable energy, uh, but in practice, it would only be renewable energy that put up its hand to take advantage of it because uh, uh, thermal-based uh, investment is is, uh, is is in generation is no longer um, economically feasible. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jim, did you have anything that you'd like to add to that about the role of government? Uh, no, I, I think... Uh... Professor Garneau summed it up uh, perfectly. There is a lot that companies will try to do uh, of their own accord, as, as Dan's paper shows. The economic advantages of moving into renewables are, are amazing, but uh, we absolutely need government to, to create the right context, provide the infrastructure and the public goods that are needed to make it happen. So I, I agree fully with uh, Professor Garneau. Um, I might go after this question to uh, Robin Gray. Robin Gray, if you are on the line, uh, we'll come to you after this next question. Um, this next question is from Michael Johnston and uh, it echoes a question that we also received earlier from Neil Watson. And they ask, um, our adversarial political system seems incapable of rational discussion on climate change and that science is continuously relegated and even denigrated. Um, notwithstanding um, its singular contribution in combating the pandemic. So the question to the panel is, how can we promote science-based discussion on renewables and climate change? I might come to you again first, Professor. Well, I've sort of been in the middle of this for a dozen years, and uh, I'd contest the view that the advers adversarial political system makes it impossible to get these things right. Uh, uh, my first review was commissioned in uh, 2007 by all of the governments of Australia, uh, federal and state, and the work had the uh, support of the opposition in the federal parliament, then led by Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, now, all of that blew apart when uh, divisions within the Liberal Party meant that the Liberal Party was not able to sustain the support it had undertaken uh, for uh, uh, for a set of policies that would uh, allow economically efficient reduction in emissions. But for a time, uh, we, we did have it right. So let's not uh, hit up on ourselves uh, excessively. Uh, we, we haven't always got it wrong. Uh, we also had in place um, the world's most effective set of policies uh, uh, for economically efficient reduction in emissions from 2012 to 2014. And for a couple of years, emissions fell by, uh, uh, fell at the rate that they have to keep falling at if we're going to have zero emissions by the middle of the century. And it was done in a way that was economically efficient, didn't disrupt uh, industry, in fact, provided uh, some incentives for, uh, uh, for some, uh, uh, some new uh, e economic uh, activity. Now, again, the politics blew that apart, but, but I don't think that was inevitable. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, contest over the, the politics and uh, uh, we did get a, a sad outcome, but I don't think that outcome was um, inevitable. I don't think we should give up on our political system. And, and I think that, um, uh, that uh, Neil's quite right to draw attention to uh, our greatest success in using science in combating COVID-19. Uh, uh, in recent years in Australia, and we've got some things in common with um, the, the United States and the United Kingdom in this respect, uh, knowledge has been downgraded, uh, expertise has been downgraded, uh, people with expertise have been denigrated by parts of the political process uh, because they have expertise. They're, they're, uh, 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 they're, they're experts and therefore they're not qualified to uh, speak about public policy. We, we've had big noise to that effect and that's why we've got uh, leaders in the United States and the United Kingdom that 
that have led their country into very difficult situations in dealing with, uh, uh, with COVID-19. Uh, well, we haven't got into that bad space on this disease and um, our government, uh, in, uh, including through cooperation between state and federal governments, uh, has been able to utilize scientific knowledge. So that again is evidence that we need not always get it wrong. And I think that uh, Neil's right in uh, drawing attention to that. Uh, how can we get it right uh, in the use of science on climate? Uh, well, uh, I think in the Australian community, there's quite strong support for uh, taking seriously the climate science as there is for taking seriously the medical science. Um, I, I think that uh, by discussing these issues widely, uh, by making uh, uh, clear that there is a strong community support, we, we may be able to, uh, to, to lock in a similar support for uh, evidence-based policy on climate to that which we've seen on medical issues recently. Ebony, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Robin Gray, are you there? Would you like to ask a question of the panel? Hello. Uh, Professor Garner, I wondered what it is that the ordinary citizen can do to encourage our leaders to be brave in making decisions about our economic future relative to energy production. Well, as citizens in a democracy, we've got uh, a wonderful opportunity just to let our opinions be, be known and uh, through all of the mechanisms that uh, we, we've got for that. And uh, uh, I think one very important thing is that we don't give up. Uh, I, I suppose I could be excused for giving up after the failures of the last dozen years, but uh, I haven't. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think... I think it's very important that each of us as citizens um, uh, uh, let our, uh, our fellow citizens and our leaders know that we think this issue is very important, it's got to be dealt with, and it can be dealt with in a way that uh, is fair right across the Australian community and uh, is consistent with growing prosperity. In fact, it might, it's a precondition for sustainable prosperity. So let's keep uh, talking about it. Uh, encouraging each other uh, and uh, and being very clear uh, in uh, all of our interactions with uh, fellow citizens and leaders that uh, it's crucial that they get this right and they won't have our support unless they do. Thank you. I think uh, our next question is from Meg Kirkman and I might address this to you, Jim and Dan. Uh, on jobs, are the skills of workers currently employed in fossil fuel related industries likely to easily transfer to new opportunities in a low emissions economy? First to you, Jim. Uh, actually, I'll pass to Dan. Uh, he's, he's been looking at the skills uh, inputs and, uh, and absolutely will we'll take this question. Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, Yes and no. So, for example, uh, in the uh, electrical trades, there's certainly transferable skills that right now are employed uh, in fossil fuels that, or in that industry that we know are transferable to um, renewables. And we know that because we've seen it done. So, for example, in Norway, for example, um, uh, electrical engineers went from building offshore oil rigs uh, to uh, offshore um, wind turbines. Um, elsewhere, uh, we're, we're actually going to have to do um, the legwork of making sure that um, people are supported to, uh, to retrain. And there have been some examples of this being done extraordinarily well. Uh, so uh, the example that comes to mind, for instance, is the, the closure of coal mining in, in North Rhine-Westphalia, where uh, there weren't any, uh, so that's in Germany rather, uh, where there weren't any um, uh, involuntary job losses associated with the closure of that industry. Um, so people did retrain to move into other industries, but that was supported by government uh, and, uh, and, and industry uh, for them to, to do that. Um, so, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to hedge a little bit on this one and say, I think 
government's going to need to step up to make sure that the transition is as uh, smooth and, and humane as can possibly be uh, to make sure workers are looked after. Thank you. Uh, did you want to add anything to that, Professor Garneau? Uh, no, I think that I think that that's right. But one one point worth making is that the regions and the industrial locations of a lot of the old coal-based uh, power generation have a lot of the infrastructure and some of the skills that are going to be very important in building the industries of the future. And I point out in Superpower that uh, uh, that we're, that. Uh, uh, the nodes of the old transmission systems will have a lot of advantages uh, as locations for industrial production. Um, uh, the ports of Gladstone, Newcastle, uh, Port Kembla, uh, Portland in Victoria, the Upper Spencer Gulf in South Australia, and away from ports, the coal generation centres in Collie in Western Australia, the Latrobe Valley, uh, will all be important uh, 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 potentially competitive centres for uh, uh, manufacturing uh, use of uh, uh, renewable energy in the zero emissions economy of the future. The, the, the transmission lines that in the past took uh, power out from uh, out to everywhere can, can bring renewable energy back. Just take Collie in Western Australia, uh, uh, at 150 kilometres south of Perth, uh, uh, the coal uh, generators there used to uh, send power back to Perth, uh, all the way up the coast to Geraldton, uh, way east through the wheat belt, the gold fields of Kalgoorlie, south down to uh, Albany and the Great Southern. Uh, well, a lot of those regions are going to be big centres of very low cost uh, renewable energy. Perth, which uh, is uh, expanding very rapidly as a centre of rooftop solar, so that in the middle of the day you've often got a surplus of, uh, of energy and be the source of power coming back. Uh, up in Geraldton, uh, world-class uh, uh, wind resources may be the best in the world and very good solar in the, uh, in the eastern wheat belt in Kalgoorlie, very good wind and solar, very good wind down south. So uh, judicious uh, adjustment to uh, what's already there can make the southwest of WA uh, a very competitive manufacturing centre. Um, thank you for that answer. And Max Hooper, if you are still on the line and still have a question, we're going to come to you after this next question, uh, which is from Fred Sim, who asks or says, it sounds like we really put all our eggs in one basket and lost sight of the global picture during the mining boom that solar and wind obviously work in our favour, and he too has cited WA. Um, also having advantages in rare earths, which are important for things like battery storage. Um, what are Professor Garneau's thoughts on bringing the processing of these rare earths, along with its risks, onto Australian soil, and then the manufacturing of battery storage and things like that? I think the, the processing of a lot of the materials that are going to be important in the zero emissions economy of the future uh, is a natural for Australia, and and the uh, uh, the, the report before us uh, from the Australia Institute uh, uh, discusses that at, at some length. Uh, but uh, all of the the uh, 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 new industries, solar and, and, and wind equipment, uh, batteries, uh, but uh, electric cars uh, are going to require. Uh, very large quantities of uh, metals, the, the mineral resources for which are abundant in Australia, and a lot of them use uh, a lot of energy in processing. So processing all of those things in Australia uh, is a natural. We, we already do some of it, we can do lots more. Um, uh, for batteries themselves, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, th that's going to depend on uh, whether we can um, uh, get back to uh, 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 efficient uh, uh, use of uh, advanced technologies. Um, uh, the, the battery battery production on a very large scale is a new industry. Uh, so uh, the fact that uh, we don't have one already is not a disadvantage. Very hard to get back into uh, old technology cars in competition with Detroit and uh, Nagoya. Uh, but, uh, uh, but 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 complete, completely new industries. We don't have that historical disadvantage. Um, uh, 
uh, we know from the, what Musk is doing in uh, Nevada that, uh, uh, that that high wages are not a uh, uh, a barrier to uh, uh, low cost uh, battery production. So that's an industry that uh, must have a chance. Uh, we we need uh, entrepreneurs uh, to be carefully uh, uh, exploring uh, how you would go about. Uh, introducing those competitively in Australia and then and then getting on with it. Dan or Jim, did you want to add anything to that? No, uh, we'll go to our next question then, uh, which is from, uh, oh, hang on, Max, I told you I was going to come to you next. Are you there, Max? Thanks, Ebony, and um, thanks, uh, Ross, Jim and Dan for being there. Um, I, I just wanted, my question was for Ross, but I'm happy for anyone else to, to answer as well. But um, there was Cheryl Durant, who was on 7.30 report about a week or so ago, and she's a retiring head of um, disaster preparedness in ADF. And um, there's a report that was prepared about Australia's national resilience to large shocks to the economy, um, uh, such as a pandemic, which has come to to bear fruit with COVID. And they also looked at any disruptions to global shipping that were gonna really severely impact the country. Um, there, was a, there was a byline in that article that two to three months um, of no supplies would be enough to d destroy the Australian economy. So um, it's a very existential threat. Um, so for Ross, I was just wondering if, um, are there any key strategic areas that you see as the biggest risk to our manufacturing and supply chains and our national resilience? And given the importance of what's in Cheryl's report and the people who worked on it, um, do you think it's, it's time to have a look at those issues the same way that your report looked into climate change and, you know, these are, these are issues that should be discussed publicly? Thank you. I haven't read uh, Cheryl's report, so I don't want to comment on it till I've uh, read it. Uh, but a general point is that uh, uh, as a country of, th of uh, 25 million people, uh, uh, Australia needs international trade. Uh, we, we can't uh, have a high standard of living and be autarkic. Uh, that, that's that's a, a reality. We, we, we need uh, global uh, uh, peace and good order uh, to do well ourselves. And so uh, I, I think we have to be a little bit careful of thinking that uh, we've got a future in just cutting ourselves off uh, from the rest of the world. Um, uh, uh, there are some uh, points of vulnerability that we can cover off. Uh, uh, for us not to have national stocks of, uh, uh, of basic protective gear against a pandemic uh, is uh, uh, at least an oversight. Uh, the, uh, I've just read recently that uh, Britain had that, but the, uh, the, the current government in Britain decided to get rid of it, and uh, uh, that, that was at least an oversight. Uh, um, uh, whether uh, uh, the cost-effective way of uh, preparing you uh, for uh, for that sort of emergency is to uh, manufacture things domestically is not uh, is not so clear. There are a number of ways you can provide yourself with resilience, and I don't think we can uh, ignore uh, the, the costs of overdoing self-sufficiency. Of self-sufficiency, I think the future of Australian manufacturing is built around finding. The niches, unfortunately, the, fortunately, there are some very big ones where we can be globally competitive and then work to make uh, the, the international environment uh, a secure one for us. Um, Dan, I wonder if you might um, want to add anything there around that concept of resilience when it comes to manufacturing in particular. Yeah, I agree um, with, with Ross's comments just now and uh, um, my argument is not a protectionist one, uh, the one that I'm making in the report. Rather, what I'm saying is that we have uh, these very significant advantages in certain areas um, that, that make us um, competitive, that make us 
very good exporters potentially uh, in various areas and at the same time also improve our national resilience um, make us less dependent on on foreign manufacturers as well um, so i'm certainly not saying that that trade should be uh, reduced or removed uh, from our list of national activities if you like um, but uh, I, I definitely think that there is potential uh, for Australia to become um, more self-sufficient when emergency strikes as it has recently. Thank you I think we've probably got time for one last question here so I might ask all the panelists to comment on it. Uh, it's from Otto Chemis who asks um, that the official cash rate is at a record low and that the Professor Garno has uh, previously said that falling interest rates improve the competitiveness of renewables which are more capital intensive than coal and gas. Um, so first to you Professor, what do you think are the consequences of the pandemic for the uptake of renewable technologies in Australia going forward? Yes, uh, well, first, uh, through, the, through the point that Otto has made about uh, the cost of capital, uh, in, in my view, uh, there have been changes in uh, the savings and investment tendencies around the world that mean there is a surplus of capital globally that's, that's a long-term phenomenon, not a uh, short-term one, and that uh, systematically reduces the costs of uh, capital intensive processes relative to others and improves the competitiveness of, of all of the zero emissions uh, uh, technologies, um, solar and wind, battery storage, pumped hydro storage, the electric car uh, um, in comparison with uh, fossil energy based uh, uh, activities. That, that's here to stay. Uh, the cash rate going down to zero, my own view is that uh, that's belated, uh, that um, uh, the high levels of, uh, of underemployment in Australia, the economy not running as strong as it, as it should have meant that we should have had uh, uh, cash rates where they are now for some time, it would have brought the exchange rate down and uh, given a boost to competitiveness of uh, internationally oriented manufacturing and other industry. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the, uh, the COVID crisis has caused the Reserve Bank to, to do what I think they should have done otherwise. otherwise. The interesting thing about the Reserve Bank's response is that they've, they've committed to those low interest rates uh, for several years. So uh, that provides some confidence about future uh, investment. Um, uh, COVID uh, 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 temporarily has reduced dramatically the price of gas, coal, uh, coal-based uh, energy and oil. Uh, and that helps temporarily to keep uh, some of the old industries alive. Uh, but the, uh, but it, at the same time, it's destroying the, uh, uh, the, the business model, the economic base of um, the, the coal, gas and uh, oil industries. Uh, we'll only get back to equilibrium in those markets with a lot of co closure of capacity. And once closed, a lot of that's not going to open again. And so uh, temporarily, those very low prices uh, uh, discourage investment in the new energy, uh, but uh, that's part of a process that over the medium term uh, will strengthen incentives for the new energy. Uh, Dan, I might come to you next. Um, the consequences of the pandemic for the uptake of renewable technologies going forward. Um, I think it's a political decision fundamentally, and I, I don't just mean made for us uh, or on our behalf by our politicians, but I think, I think it's a question for the polity and the broad. I, I think we need to, if we want to chart this course to a re renewable future and follow through on it, that's, that's a decision that we need to make as a society, I think economically it's certainly viable. Um, the question is uh, just whether we have um, the the policy bravery um, to to set out on that course. And and I, there's never been a better time uh, in Australian economic history uh, to to do so. Uh, as uh, as Ross has said, the, the cost of capital are so so low. Um, Understandably, business isn't going to lead it. I mean, it's it's 
Um, it's a terrifying time to invest uh, for, for businesses, I think. Um, and, and I mean, kudos to the ones that, that are, uh, that are setting up um, um, power purchase agreements and are building their own um, solar panel arrays and, and, and so on. Um, good for them. Uh, but fundamentally, it's going to have to be um, uh, something where uh, the public works in partnership with government, works in partnership with business um, to go forward with this. Jim, what about you? You know, Ebony, I think there's no better time to launch a, a really ambitious, long-lasting nation-building program uh, to put money into motion. We are going to need that kind of reconstruction after the pandemic because uh, we're already into what is the worst recession uh, probably since the Great Depression. And it's not going to cure itself just by waiting for a normal cyclical upturn. Uh, we're going to need government to take a leading role uh, to put Australians back to work and uh, get, get incomes flowing and get confidence restored. And I can't think of a better thing to do than take all that free money that's out there. The government can borrow uh, for free and the Reserve Bank is helping them. Uh, build the renewable energy uh, projects, build the transmission infrastructure that goes with it and invest in building these value-added manufacturing sectors that can feed into the renewable energy system uh, from lithium batteries to electric vehicles to rolling stock for public transit to green hydrogen. Those are all the things that Dan maps out in his report. And uh, if anything, the, the, the catastrophe that we're facing economically after the pandemic is a, a perfect opportunity uh, for government to say this is a, a peaceful reconstruction program that will leave us better off at the end of the day. Um, we've actually still got a few more minutes, so I just might take, there's two questions that have jumped out at me here. Um, one is Jerry uh, Corvasanos, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Jerry, um, who asks the panel to address the paradox, please. He comments that uh, the panelists all seem quite positive in terms of the market potential, whereas the chat where everyone's chatting away about this discussion seems quite pessimistic. Um, and Susan Pinnock has also asked, would the continuation of the National Cabinet help facilitate the transition in manufacturing that, um, that the panel is after? Um, again, uh, Ross, I might come to you first. I've seen all of the chat and certainly uh, that, there's uh, plenty of room for, for pessimism. Uh, we won't build a good future uh, on pessimism. Uh, and it is a reality that the opportunity is there for us to, to build a different kind of future uh, in which um, uh, a wide range of new economic activities, including manufacturing, using our natural resources is, is possible. Uh, so uh, uh, as, as uh, Jim said, we, uh, no, it, no, it was uh, Dan, uh, that these are times of political choice. We can choose to think it's impossible and to uh, be pessimistic about it, uh, but the opportunity is there for us to choose and to promote uh, if we want to. Uh, Jim, what do you think about that contrast? Oh, well, I mean, people have to let off steam for sure. And there's <laughs> lots to worry about in the world, but uh, we're all optimistic. Otherwise, we wouldn't be on this call. We wouldn't be supporting the fine work of the Australian Institute and the Centre for Future Work. And we wouldn't be out there campaigning for, uh, for a better future, both economically and environmentally. So uh, ultimately, I am uh, highly optimistic that uh, as a human race, we will recognise what needs to be done. And uh, I think Dan's paper shows there's all kinds of opportunity to make that happen. Uh, final word to you, Dan. Thanks. Yeah, I, I understand the, the pessimism as well. And of course, I, I have my moments, but I'm fundamentally an optimist. And, uh, and, and I, I think that pessimism comes from um, what has been a sense of political inertia or gridlock in the past. But as we can see, during this crisis, Government actually has amazing levers at its disposal and is less ideological uh, than than we've perhaps thought in the in the past. Even uh, even even a conservative government can do wildly uh, wildly Keynesian things when when the mood takes it. Um, so I, I think it's a question of of. Um, selling the case uh, to the government that that this can be their their legacy. Um, uh, you know, this is this is a, a an amazing 
moment uh, to reorient Australia's economic and industrial history. Well, thank you very much. We, wa we might uh, wrap it up there. And uh, I think if, if uh, Ross Garneau can still be optimistic about the future after the, the last couple of years of climate change policy in particular, then there's a uh, reason for all of us to be optimistic. But thank you very much to all of our panelists for their time today. Thank you, Professor Ross Garneau, uh, Jim Stanford and Dan Nahum from the Centre for Future Work. We really appreciate your time. Um, and thank you everyone for your great questions. I'm really sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but hopefully we covered uh, a good portion of them there. And they were really great questions. So hopefully you've enjoyed that discussion. Um, if you are in a position to chip in a few dollars to help cover the costs of these webinars, which aren't free to put on, you can do that at our website, tai.org.au and every little bit does help. And please join us for next week's webinar on the international responses to COVID-19 with former Prime Minister of New Zealand, Helen Clark, in conversation with Alan Beam, the head of Australia, the Australia Institute's International and Security Affairs Program. That's on next Wednesday, the 13th of May, from noon Australian Eastern Standard Time or 2 p.m. New Zealand Standard Time. And make sure that you're subscribed to our podcast, Follow the Money, and make sure that you stay home if you can, keep washing your hands and stay safe. Thanks very much everyone and we hope to see you next week.